Please welcome up Lieutenant Sean Madej. Thank you, Brady. I appreciate the introduction. Good morning, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to come here this morning and, uh, and speak with you all. Uh, I want to start out by thanking you, because the technology you are developing, the hardware and software solutions that you are developing and selling are really changing the way that this, this government's defense and intelligence apparatuses are working. And that's a good thing. When Operation Husky was commenced in uh, 1943 in the Allied powers invaded Sicily, they did so with four million maps. And so as each individual ground unit made progress, they charted that progress on their specific map. And collating that information was, was just never possible. And unfortunately, uh, we are still suffering from the four million map problem. As we, in the defense uh, apparatus, attack challenges in Iraq and Afghanistan, we're doing so across a wide array of maps and charts. So a quick uh, just introduction to, to who I am and where I sit in this apparatus so you get an appreciation for the information I have to convey. Uh, the Department of Defense is, is a giant bureaucracy, but it is just one of 14 executive departments. I work for the United States Air Force, which is one of three services and 17 agencies that fall under the auspices of the Department of Defense. I work for Air Mobility Command, which is one of eight major commands within the U.S. Air Force. And day to day, I work at Travis Air Force Base in the 60th Air Mobility Wing, just up the road here in the East Bay. But there are 105 other units just within the Air Force that do exactly what I do on a day to day basis. As an intelligence officer, I sit at the nexus of that bureaucracy and the intelligence community, which is itself 16 federated agencies. So the only reason I introduce this slide is just to tell you that this is a very complex organizational structure, and there are a lot of people out there with a lot of critical information. And at the end of the day, my goal is to get the critical information to the warfighter on the ground so that they can get out ahead of the threat or the bad guys. I work specifically with mobility aircraft. So these are very large aircraft uh, that can uh, take people, equipment, and supplies anywhere in the world. Mobility aircraft are really the workhorse of US defense and foreign policy. 1,200 of these aircraft in the US inventory, and at any given time, we have them on five different continents and 100 different countries. Their unlimited range gives them the ability to force project around the world. Today, a KC-10 will take off from Travis Air Force Base and will fly unrefueled to the United Arab Emirates uh, without stopping. So answering the question of where are the people is very, is very challenging and it's very dynamic for us. As an intelligence officer, my critical functions are to forecast where the adversary is presenting a risk to our operations and where they may want to inter intersect these, uh, these mobility aircraft. The problem I have is that being a part of both of those large bureaucracies gives me access to tons of data, too much data. And function-specific databases are, are throughout this bureaucracy, and to tap into them quickly is very challenging. We are very reliant on email, and the point-to-point -point nature of that communication style means that critical information is spread across everyone's inbox. And we in the United States Air Force uh, undoubtedly have the world's largest repository of PowerPoint slides. We love PowerPoint. It's an, awesome, uh, it's an awesome presentation tool, but it presents some very unique challenges when we look to try to collate data and provide our customers. My customer is the pilot who walks in my door. And when that pilot asks me a question, it's very challenging for me to go back and try to perform analysis ac across PowerPoint slides. So creating meaning and displaying relation using these legacy processes is very cumbersome for us. And it is, it is so bad that we consistently put maps on slides. At the same time, you all are completely transitioning the consumer market. So you've moved to interactive maps and GPS technology, and it's become ubiquitous. When the pilot drives to the base, he has uh, the access to location-based services on his GPS. He can hit a button and ask where the nearest Starbucks is. But when he arrives at the base, my analysts have a, have a real hard time telling him how many aircraft have been shot at within 30 nautical miles of Baghdad International Airport in the last day. And a lot of our challenges there are because of the way we store that data and access that data. So as, you, as we as consumers are transitioning from asking to directions to expecting to be navigated, uh, that is creeping into the defense and intelligence community. And that's a good thing because it's making us rethink the way we do business. 
Where we want to get is to a place where we are putting those slides on a map, uh, not the, uh, not the uh, maps on a slide. Just anecdotal here, uh, we have a massive fleet of intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft. We can take high quality, uh, high resolution, satellite, EO, and IR imagery anywhere in the world at any given time. The problem is when we present this to an air crew member now, this may have been taken an hour ago, they say, well, can I get the same thing on my desktop at home, but can I get it in color? And so it's really, it's really challenging with the conventional wisdom associated with the intelligence function within the, the Department of Defense. And that's a good thing because it's challenging our analysts to, to be actual analysts. About 18 months ago now, we launched an initiative we called The Intersect. This was a glorified mashup. We did it to track 900 air mobility missions a day. We wanted to uh, track all the deployed personnel, uh, tens of thousands of people deployed around the world. And we'd always ask the question, where are the people? We just wanted to actually show it. And then we overlaid live threat information. So the goal is that our analysts could get away from collating all this information. They could just go to a single source and start to identify where our blue operations may intersect uh, the red threats. And it, the goal is to provide the air crew with situational awareness and the commanders with battle space awareness. This initiative was vetted for us during uh, the first week in August 2008 when the Georgia-Russia conflict broke out. Because we were using this tool, because we were uh, visualizing our data, we had the ability to identify that, that this conflict was going to happen and that it was going to significantly affect the airways our crews were using to fly from, Georgia, uh, from Germany to Iraq. Using this tool, we identified the choke point, we made uh, some adjustments, and we actually called the crews in flight you know, satellite phones, and, and we did not lose a single uh, operational sortie through this event. So that gained us a lot of praise throughout the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and the Department of Homeland Security. What I'm here to tell you today is that the Project Intersect is, is really just a, a, a giant green curtain, because for all intents and purposes, it is not impressive from a technical perspective. It is just a glorified Google Earth mashup. I'm not here today to endorse any specific product, but Google Earth was available to us, and so that's what we used to create this mashup. We provided a web-based web data input for all of our deployed folks. So I have right now my colleagues working on the ground in the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Iraq, Afghanistan, Spain, Turkey, and providing them that web-based input allowed them to share their information, to share what they knew. We stored it in a variety of different ways, and then we output it all to KML. So the analysts had a composite situational display on their desk, and they could provide the air crew or their boss with the information they needed to make a command decision. We ran this across our worldwide classified network called CIPRNET, and it really created for us a clearer uh, picture of where our information gaps existed. And the Air Force has a lot of unique capabilities to bridge those information gaps if we know where they are. And so really where this project has, has transformed and, and morphed into is an identification of where we don't have information, and it is a way that we're dealing with the demand for persistent surveillance. Today, Army, grounds, uh, Army ground units on, on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan, they need to know what's around that next corner. They need to know what's on that next street. And as General David Deptula, the, uh, the, the Air Force general in charge of intelligence, has stated, demand exceeds supply. Well, if we rethink that a little bit, we really just need to start using that supply differently. And unfortunately, our bandwidth and our storage requirements aren't enabling easy access to that information. We're providing, uh, we are producing literally petabytes of full mission video every day. And that presents some unique challenges for a group of people who aren't specifically technical in nature. No Air Force intelligence personnel is recruited because of their technical background. Uh, it just isn't, isn't a requirement. Our goal is to familiarize the units with the environment where they're going to be working before they put boots on the ground. This picture was taken out of the window of a C-130 yesterday on approach into an airfield in Burma. Our challenge is literally, how do we get this picture to the Air Force C-130 flying into this airfield an hour behind this aircraft? Or the Australian aircraft flying in an hour and a half later, and the British aircraft flying in one hour from then? It's a challenge that we're just now starting to tackle, but you all have honestly uh, come up with innovative solutions to address uh, years ago. So here are our data problems. We have compartmentalization uh, to the 10th degree. We have an ad hoc infrastructure. We have added servers, and we've added software, and we've added databases as necessary, and we've never really wrapped our arms around a strategic vision of what our requirements are. It's given us no common standards, and it's, it's all masked by a cloak of secrecy. That's why you folks haven't seen it. Intrinsic in all of this is a lot of opportunity, a lot of niches. 
and I think a lot of profit for the folks who know how to ask the right questions and know how to market their, their products to the right people. As a culture, we have some, some progress to make, uh, and I'm sp speaking specifically of Intel analysts and, and Department of Defense professionals, but we need to become more technical. And there are opportunities right now uh, for a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks to provide that training to help us become more technical, to help us get past our jargons and acronyms so that we can communicate freely with you and we don't sound like we're speaking gibberish uh, when we try to communicate our requirements to you. And then we have a lot of comfort with legacy tools, which is all right, but we need to either have those tools transform or we need to retool our own personal capabilities. The intelligence community and the Department of Defense have said we need to get past these barriers. We need to achieve a more effective intelligence apparatus for this country. There's been little uh, lateral information sharing over the last uh, 20 years. We, there's hardly any regular collaboration. And these legacy processes are holding us back. The Director of National Intelligence has created a vision 2015, which basically calls for the types of software and hardware solutions that you folks are producing. Enterprise integration, distributed problem solving. We are just now beginning to ask, where are the people? Uh, and where are the, where are the bad guys? And I think you all have a unique opportunity to get involved in this process and profit from it. The folks calling for that change are those you see denoted here, the people in the Department of Defense and the strategic leadership in the intelligence community. A lot of those software solutions, though, are being targeted to the big Air Force, sell it to the big Air Force. It's a large contract. It's, it's the big target. But my pitch to you is that there are 105 Intel units that do the same thing I do every single day, and that's just within one echelon of this massive bureaucracy. If you, can, if you can present your information uh, and your sales literature in just a little bit of a different way, uh, I think that there's some real opportunities for us to work together and to, uh, to integrate the uh, solutions you've produced. Specifically, what I mean is that you already have the customers. The pilots I work for already love your tools. They love your web-based tools. They love your hardware and software solutions. They can't get enough of it on their cell phones. You already have them. How do we now bridge the gap to get them uh, to expect the same from us so that we, in turn, uh, come to you and, and purchase your solutions. I don't know. Uh, case studies are a great way to do it. Uh, working with academ academia, and, uh, and then also just as simple as a, a link on your website, planting the seed in the back of their head that, hey, we sell government solutions. And that may be the way to do it. Uh, because honestly, you have a lot of respect uh, from me and from all the people I work with, because the things you're doing are, are truly revolutionary from where we sit. And we appreciate it, we need the technology, and uh, it's all toward making America robust and uh, protecting those young troops on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I appreciate your time, I appreciate uh, sincerely what you do, and look forward to, uh, to speaking with you in the halls or uh, at the bar this evening. So thanks for your time. <laughs>